What's up YouTube? Daniel Carter at Afro Herb Keeper here. I'm finally back after a two and a half month hiatus and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to my reptile room. Now I know I've been inactive for a lot longer than usual and that's for two big reasons. Firstly, I've been traveling. I've got a lot of footage from Costa Rica that I'm going to be going through in the coming months I think you guys are really going to enjoy. Secondly, this video is being uploaded at a pretty big time in my life. I'm actually about a week or two away from transitioning from high school to the University of Texas at Austin. And unfortunately, as the title suggests, that also means that this fifth reptile room tour is also my last. That is, until I get my animals back from their designated foster homes and they're returned to me when I'm in pet-friendly housing. Hopefully, in about a year, maybe a year and a half, we'll have another tour up, but we'll have to wait and see. Many of my reptiles and amphibians will continue their use as educational animals at the local elementary school. Uh, a few others are going to be kept by local friends, and some, including the turtles, are going to be kept by my mom. Everyone is going to be cared for by a keeper that I know personally, someone who will treat the animals with respect and keep them happy and healthy in their new environments. That said, without any further ado, we have a lot to cover today, and I'm really excited to show you guys a few new additions. Let's get started. It makes sense to me to start front and center with the largest enclosure in my room, a 70 gallon tank housing two female bearded dragons. Spike and Lizzie are a pair of rescues that came to me a couple years ago in December. Their previous owner lost interest and wasn't caring for them properly, so when they came to me I needed to nurse them back to health. As it stands right now, both of them and their enclosure will be going to a local elementary school. When putting together the enclosure of any animal, I seek to replicate its natural habitat in a way that enriches them, that keeps them from being bored, and allows them to exhibit natural behaviors. The side of their enclosure they greatly prefer is the hot end. This includes a basking platform which Lizzie is on, a large branch that Spike frequents, some fake plants for decoration, and a number of bricks and limestone tiles to provide some height. I get quite a few comments about the substrate in my bearded dragon enclosure. While many people prefer to house their beardies on newspaper or paper towel, repti carpet, I prefer to use a mixture of organic potting soil and sand about 75% soil and 25% sand. This mixture encourages natural behaviors such as digging and burrowing, and the bricks and flat rocks that they have on this side of their enclosure help file down their nails. Oftentimes people worry that the dirt will clog their systems and make them impacted, which is a condition in which their digestive systems can't pass any food. However, if your bearded dragons are healthy, or if you feed them in a separate enclosure like I do, there's very little risk of impaction. Both of these lizards are very unique in terms of personality, uh, level of activity, and temperament. Spike here on my shoulder is incredibly relaxed and normally doesn't move at all throughout the day. Lizzie here, on the other hand, as you can see, is quite flighty, always looking for different things to do, and she's a little bit territorial towards Spike, which can be an issue when housing them together, but I've never had any problems in the past. It's generally recommended to keep your beardy separate, but I'm willing to take the risk due to space constraints. I'm going to return these two to their enclosure now so they can continue to get ready to be moved to the elementary school. Spike and Lizzie may have the largest enclosure in my room, but by no means are they the largest animals. That title would go to Blue, my Argentine black and white tegu. Confusion regarding Blue's history is one of the biggest reasons I get negative comments on my channel. Blue was actually captured in the wild by me but he was not captured in his native habitat. Argentine tegus are an invasive species in the Florida Everglades, and as a whole, they're responsible for millions of dollars in damages and countless deaths of endangered reptiles and birds. I kept Blue after capturing him in the Florida Everglades just over a year ago because the only other legal option would have been to euthanize him. To release him back into the wild would have been not only illegal, but ethically wrong from an environmental standpoint. In the past year, Blue has tamed down incredibly well, and he's become one of my best and friendliest animals. He works great with kids, and he's an incredible educational animal. Even though, counting his tail, he's already reached about three and a half, maybe four feet, he still has a lot of growing to do. He is a male, and as such, he's going to reach between five and six feet long as an adult. 
I get plenty of comments stating that he's actually a female, but he makes it pretty clear when he uses the bathroom that that's not the case. Now about a sixth of Blue's enclosure is taken up by his water dish. It's large enough for him to bathe in anytime he wants, but he soils it so often that I end up replacing it uh, at least once a day. His substrate is a mixture of mostly cypress mulch and coconut core. This mixture makes it easy for him to dig and it holds humidity very well. In addition to his substrate, he's got numerous large wood pieces and a few pieces of cork bark to hide under. He also has a Zoomed Reptisun 5.0 UVB bulb and a red heat lamp that's attached to a thermostat so it never gets too hot. Blue is an omnivore, so in addition to high protein cat food, he also eats ground turkey, eggs, white fish, and lots of fruits, such as mango and berries. You can see he does a great job with whatever he's given. Now, although Blue has a relatively small enclosure, this doesn't mean that he doesn't have enough space. Blue actually spends the majority of his time roaming my bedroom. I give him free reign of the floor space and he usually just crawls around and sleeps during the day. In the evening, I put him back in his cage so that he can eat, drink, and return to the proper humidity level. While Blue continues to work on his cat food, I think it's time to visit the second largest lizard in my room, and that is Skink, my northern blue tongue skink. Of all my current lizards, Skink is the one that I've had for the longest amount of time. He's a very personable animal, and though he's a little bit cage aggressive, he does great once he's out. Skink is housed in a pretty simple setup. It's the minimum size enclosure that I would recommend for his species, which is a 40 gallon breeder terrarium. The left side includes a basking spot and a warm cave, and the right side includes a large water dish. Along the back, there's a very large piece of cork bark that's split down the middle to sort of resemble a fallen log. He spends most of his time nestled underneath that. On top of his cage, he has the same lights as the bearded dragons, a 100 watt Repti basking spot lamp, and a 10.0 Repti Sun UVB bulb. Overall, blue tongue skinks are a really incredible species that I would highly recommend as a starter lizard. They're easy to take care of, they don't really require live prey, and they're very docile when raised from juveniles. Skink here receives the same salads that the bearded dragons do about once or twice a week, as well as high protein cat food, ground turkey, egg, and numerous berries. Though I really wish I could keep Skink as I start my college career, he is among the animals that will be going to the elementary school. I have no doubt he'll do a great job there. With all the larger lizards out of the way, it's time to move on to the right, to my 7 foot by 7 foot storage shelf. The top row of this shelf contains all of my arboreal geckos, a breeding colony of gold dust day geckos, and an adult female crested gecko. Gold dust day geckos are a beautiful but really skittish species. As such, they make great display animals, but they're not really a pet you want to handle. I keep my three adults in a pair of 12 by 12 by 18 exoterra cages, and I keep the juveniles in little 16 ounce cups. Once the babies are old enough to sex or have their gender determined, I rehome them to new owners. Gold dust day geckos have clutches of two eggs, uh, maybe once every three or four months. This is a brand new baby who only hatched out about last week. He or she is eating flightless fruit flies and a little bit of Pangea crested gecko diet. All of my arboreal geckos get Pangea. Though, as I said, I don't recommend handling these geckos, I'm going to make one brief exception just to show you guys how tiny this baby really is. All of my gold dust day geckos are going to a local friend of mine who will be taking very good care of them and continuing the breeding project. Here's one of my sub-adults. This is one of the oldest hatchlings I have, and I think it's actually about to reach sexual maturity if it hasn't already. This is one reason I recommend not handling this species, because they are very flighty. Okay, now that these guys have all been fed, and this one has been returned to its enclosure, it's time for them to go back. And directly to the right of my day geckos is my crested gecko, Lemonhead. And it's no surprise that she is hiding out in the very back of her enclosure. I've had this big girl almost as long as I've had Skink, and it shows. She is much, much, much larger than when I got her. Lemonhead is also being housed in an exoterra enclosure, but hers is a bit larger than the day geckos. It's 18 by 18 by 18. In an attempt to make this feel like her natural habitat, I've included lots of tropical plants. In the back, there's a snake plant, which she uses as her main perch. In the front, there's a pothos, and right here is a tillandsia. 
She also has numerous cork bark tubes and a big piece of manzanita wood to perch on. Lemonhead, like the day geckos, is also feeding on Pangea crested gecko diet. Far from the arboreal geckos, down and to the right, is my only terrestrial gecko species. This tub here houses my Texas banded gecko, Watney. Watney is a really sweet lizard, and a lot of people actually mistake him for a leopard gecko when they first see him. He looks almost identical, just much, much smaller. Unlike the arboreal geckos, Watney is offered exclusively live prey, specifically dubia roach nymphs. Though some people believe it's unwise to keep any lizards on sand, North American banded geckos are actually one of the few exceptions to this rule. Not only do they thrive on sand, but most large-scale breeders keep them in it. As you can see, Watney, like the rest of the geckos, doesn't actually have a water dish. He gets all the moisture he needs through being misted. As I slide Watney back onto the shelf, it is finally time to move on to our snakes. Just above Blue's enclosure are my two larger constricting snakes, a boa constrictor named Scylla and a blood python named Kosho. Scylla is just about my best educational animal. She's a great snake, incredibly docile, really good size at this point, and she really helps me cut down on the irrational fears of snakes that a lot of people have. As you can see, Scylla is getting to be a very sizable animal, now, if you've watched any of my previous room tours, you'll know that Scylla is not just a boa constrictor, she's something called a hog island boa constrictor. This means that she is a dwarf subspecies of boa constrictor imperator. That subspecies is what gives her this natural hypomelanism. It's what gives her tan, almost kind of pink coloration. I'm going to let Scylla back into her enclosure, and as you can see, she's always sitting underneath one of her hides, and she always seems quite content with it. This is her cool hide, it's a half log and her warm hide is the small white cave on the left side. In addition to her hides, she's got a sizable water dish, a substrate, again, of cypress mulch and coconut core, and numerous pieces of grapevine which give her nice places to climb and to hang out. Though their name sounds a little bit fierce, blood pythons are actually named for the red coloration they receive as adults. Kosho is about to shed, so she's not exhibiting any of that. But if I take her out, if she lets me take her out, that is, you guys can see that she's been growing quite a bit. And if you hear that, you can hear her hissing, you can see her coiling up a bit. She's not in the mood to be handled right now. Blood pythons in general are a pretty temperamental species of snake. In addition to being a bit finicky, they are also uh, touchy when it comes to environmental conditions. They need a high humidity, and that's why her substrate is comprised of sphagnum moss. Both Kosho, Scylla, and Blue are housed in fiberglass vision cages. And since I get so many comments about it, you can buy these at visionproducts.us. However, believe it or not, Kosho is not the only python I've got for you guys in today's video. This little 10 gallon to the right of all the vision cages houses my newest addition. And if you couldn't tell by the bag he came in, this is an animal that a lot of commenters have requested I get. Now, I don't ever buy animals by request of my commenters, but this is something that both I and my girlfriend were interested in getting. So. Everybody say hi to Bowie, the Champagne Pastel Ball Python. As I said, Bowie is housed in a 10-gallon tank. He's got a bunch of sphagnum moss in the back to help retain humidity. And for his main substrate, he has the same thing as the skink. This is called Reptichip bedding. It's produced by a local company, and it's basically a larger, tidier version of coconut coir. It definitely functions well, and I've been converting more and more of my animals to it, just for ease of access. Bowie also has a decent-sized water dish. It's large enough for him to bathe in. He's always tracking sphagnum moss into it, so it looks dirtier than it actually is. You may notice in some of my snake enclosures, tiles like this. These are the tiles where I set prey items. If I feed a snake a prey item that's been frozen and then thawed, I usually set it on a block like this to ensure that they don't pick up any substrate while they're eating. So we're going to say goodbye to the new addition, move across the room to check out my garter snakes. Now this large enclosure over here does not actually include a box turtle. That's only the shell. It was found out in the wild by a friend of mine who brought it back and now it's just used as a hide for the garter snake in this cage. This is Mort. She's a very large adult female eastern blackneck garter snake, 
and she's a native species, so she goes to a lot of educational events with me. This is often referred to as one of the most beautiful snakes in the Texas Hill Country. It's even the mascot of the Austin Herpetological Society, and it's easy to see why. Out of respect for her size and her beauty, I've got her in a really nice naturalistic setup. She's got a nice log, some large rocks, a decent sized water dish, a turtle shell, and some fake plants in there, along with a substrate that allows her to create burrows. This kind of setup is really enriching for this animal and it really helps improve her quality of life. Down to the left of Mort's enclosure is Tipsy, the California red-sided garter snake. She's in a significantly larger enclosure than she was during the last reptile room tour, and that's because her cage was getting a bit small. She's almost a foot long now, and so a larger snake definitely deserves a larger home. Her enclosure is also a lot more complex than it used to be, and because the lid doesn't fit properly, I've included these safety stones on top to make sure that she can't escape. Tipsy has three hides in here, but she's actually choosing not to use any of them right now. She has two half coconuts and a large piece of fake rock that she's able to crawl under. Additionally, she's on the same repti chip bedding with some sphagnum moss mixed in to retain humidity. If we look carefully, we can actually find Tipsy in the back corner of the cage, where she's really exhibiting her beautiful red stripes. She's a very flighty snake, which means that I don't take her out to handle or bring her to any educational events. However, with that said, she makes a gorgeous display animal. For some people, the appeal of owning a garter snake is actually that they don't need to be fed rodents. Many people choose to feed them minnows, earthworms, slugs, amphibians, or any other variety of prey. However, rodents are still the most balanced diet for captive garter snakes, and as such, I've converted both Mort and Tipsy to frozen thawed rodents. Mort gets three fuzzy mice per week, and Tipsy gets two pinkies. So now that we've seen all the snakes, it's time to move on to the last reptiles in my reptile room, the turtles. And just as we had a new addition in Bowie, we've got two in the turtles. So we're going to start with the razorback musk turtles, the little guys that I've had for quite a while now. For those who don't know these two, they're about a year old and they were bred by a guy named Peter Piankowski. They're doing very well and as you can see they've grown a lot bolder since my last video. While these two used to be holed away all the time, now they are as curious as ever and uh, always looking for food, always on the prowl. Their setup has changed a little bit and largely that's due to the onset of some algae. I replaced their sand with a uh, black and white cichlid sand, which should keep a somewhat higher, more swampy pH in there. Uh, as you can see, the river rocks they've got in there are largely coated in algae now, but I've also added some hydrilla, which is a native freshwater plant that should give them something to hide under, something to perch on and munch on. Their setup is a 20 gallon Zilla aquatic turtle setup, and up here they've got a mini basking light and a mini UVB bulb. Their filter doubles as a basking platform, and they have two other uh, shallow areas in other parts of the tank. Though many people claim these turtles won't bask, they actually do on occasion. You just have to be in the right place at the right time to witness it. These little guys right now are feeding primarily on Hikari sinking carnivore pellets, bloodworms, and Zoomed musk turtle food. Though they're still very, very small, they've grown quite a bit since I got them, and they still have quite a bit of growing to do in the future. If you're interested in getting a turtle as a pet, musk turtles are actually one of the only species that I recommend for beginner turtle keepers. These animals, though they do have an attitude, stay relatively small. The adults are only between four and five inches long. As such, they can be comfortably housed in a 20, 30, or 40 gallon aquarium for their entire lives. Though you can see they're not always interested in being handled, they make great display animals and they are full of personality. Just to the right of the Razorbacks is another relatively new addition. This is my Guadalupe spiny softshell. Now since he hasn't been properly introduced yet, that should be my first priority. This little guy was brought to me by a kid who was fishing for bass in a creek somewhat close to my house. When I explained just how large these turtles can get and how hard they can be to take care of, the kid ended up handing it over to me. If this turtle is a male, it could reach up to 6 inches as an adult, and if it's a female, it could reach anywhere from a foot to 18 inches long. Obviously, that's not an animal that's going to fit into a 10 gallon tank, so as it grows, it will definitely be upgraded. For the time being, he's receiving very similar care to the Razorback Musks. 
His water is a little bit deeper and he doesn't have as many places to bask, but he does have the same light fixtures, a nice floating basking platform, the same substrate, and hydrilla. A sandy substrate is actually very beneficial for soft shells, as they'll spend a lot of their time buried in this substrate waiting for prey to come along. This turtle is also on the same diet as the musk turtles, eating primarily hikari sinking carnivore pellets, bloodworms, and floating turtle pellets. To find the third turtle, we have to move to another part of the house. The animal in here is a juvenile female three-toed box turtle. She's been featured in a number of my videos before, and before we get into her 10-gallon cage, we have to remove the 18-inch UVB light on top. This animal normally stays underneath this piece of cork bark, as you can see, and she has grown quite a lot since the last reptile room tour. I went ahead and gave her a quick shower to make her colors pop a bit and encourage her to wake up. As you can see, this turtle is really starting to get some definition on its shell. She's no longer flat or pancake shaped at all, she's really got a nice dome coming in. Additionally, you can see some adult coloration coming in on her face and on her legs. Now box turtles are very omnivorous, so this little girl is feeding on about 10 to 12 crickets per week, as well as a mixed salad of collard greens, lettuce, berries, every so often, maybe once every three or four days. Box turtles are also a species that I would recommend as a first turtle, but there are a few things to note. If you're getting a box turtle, make sure that you can give it enough space as an adult, because though they do stay somewhat small, they need a lot of space to roam. Additionally, box turtles are over-harvested in the United States. So if you're getting a box turtle, or any new pet really, make sure it was bred in captivity. It's very important not to deplete wild populations. I'm going to place this girl back in her enclosure, let her continue her nap, and move back to my room for the fifth and final turtle. This guy is an adult male three-toed box turtle. Believe it or not, he is the same species as the one we just saw. These bright red markings are pretty unusual for his species, and because of them, he's been nicknamed Darth Maul. Though he also gets salads once or twice a week, nightcrawlers are really his favorite food. As you can see, the moment he recognizes the box, he's already rayarned to go. Now Darth is currently housed in a 70 gallon Sterilite tub on a substrate of local soil and clay. The size of his enclosure is subject to change very soon, and it's likely he'll be housed outside. Now's the point in the video where we move on to the first of many amphibians. You can see them in the back there under that brick. Gulf Coast toads are a really beautiful species native to where I live. As their name suggests, they inhabit the Gulf Coast of the United States. Both individuals in this enclosure were actually caught in the wild, but there is really no shortage of them around here. The one front and center right here is named Cookies and Cream. The one in the back is Rocky Road. If you've watched any of my previous reptile room tours, you will definitely know the story behind Rocky Road. In high school, I was a member of the marching band, and one night we went to Rockdale, Texas to play a football game. Once we'd driven two and a half hours back to Lago Vista, I was about ready to go home when one of the drum majors came out of the band hall yelling my name. It turns out that Rocky Road back there had ridden the entire way inside of someone's uniform bag in their marching shoe. Even though he's a native species, it's not wise to release animals into an area other than where they were captured. Because of that, he stayed with me, and he's been a very good educational animal so far. These toads make excellent captives, they are incredible eaters. Uh, mine normally eat superworms and occasionally crickets. Their setup here is a really nice looking 20 gallon tank, and it's designed to replicate their natural habitat. These toads have really grown accustomed to living around people, so as their hides I included a pile of bricks and a flower pot. I just thought it added aesthetic appeal. Additionally, their substrate is a mixture of local clay, dirt, and oak leaves. They have a large water dish in the center, and plenty of limestone rocks and wood pieces to make it feel like home. You should always wash your hands before handling amphibians, but I wanted to give you guys a sense of the scale of these two. They are very large for their species, and due to their size and docile temperament, they make great educational animals. These two will also end up in the elementary school with the bearded dragons. 
To continue on with the rest of the amphibians, we need to get down to the bottom level of my storage shelf. These three enclosures house a small but diverse variety of large frogs and toads from around the world. On the left is an animal called the Sonoran Desert or Colorado River Toad. I've actually had this guy for a few years now. He was bred in captivity as it's actually illegal to transport them out of their native habitat. Now in their native environment of the Sonoran Desert, New Mexico, Arizona, and Mexico, these guys are actually somewhat revered. Though they look harmless enough, the glands on the sides of his neck, called paratoid glands, produce an incredibly powerful psychoactive venom. Now this guy here has actually gone through a few setup changes over the years. As it stands right now, he's actually in a 20 gallon tall terrarium with coconut chips as the bedding and a few pieces of cork bark, oak, fake plants, and a water dish. Although he is a desert species, all amphibians need water to survive, so his water dish is large enough that it takes a very long time to dry out, even if he manages to kick substrate in. This guy, just as most of my other amphibians are, is on a diet consisting primarily of superworms. As you can see, he's quite docile, and though he doesn't always succeed, he tries very hard to eat them. All things considered, I would say of all my amphibians, this guy is definitely my favorite. He has a really outgoing personality, and when he doesn't see me as a threat, he's very curious. Now directly to his right is another toxic amphibian. This guy is a Cuban tree frog, and very similarly to Blue the Tegu, he's an invasive species that I captured during a trip to Florida. As we open his enclosure here, you can see that he's had a big upgrade from the last reptile room tour. Not only is he on land with some flourishing live plants, a button fern, a kangaroo fern, and a pothos, he's also in a cage much more suited to his size and behavior. This is a 12 by 12 by 18 Zilla enclosure. Though he doesn't exactly eat on command like most of my other amphibians, this tree frog's diet is primarily superworms and crickets. Though these two look inconspicuous, Cuban tree frogs are also toxic. Many of those who aren't familiar with them and capture them in Florida find that if they rub their eyes after handling them, these guys leave a pretty nasty irritant behind. That said, despite his toxicity, he is still a very personable and hardy pet. The only negative thing I have to say about keeping these as pets, don't release them into the wild. The same is true for every kind of animal you can purchase. The reason animals become invasive species in the first place is either because they were released by negligent pet owners or they arrive there through other human means. In the case of the Cuban tree frog, it's likely most of them arrived on potted plants. To the right of the tree frog and the Sonoran desert toad is an animal that I've had much longer than both of them. This is my African clawed frog. Though her setup and care are very simple, I've had this girl longer than any of my other animals. I got this frog when I was about seven years old in something called a grow a frog kit. She arrived as a tadpole about a centimeter long, and in the meantime, she's grown to a hulking five or six inches. As I said, her care is incredibly simple. Though her water level is a little bit low right now because I'm planning to transport her to the elementary school, she lives in a 10 gallon aquarium with a flower pot as a hide and a sponge filter to clean the water. That's really all she needs. Her feeding requirements are just as simple as her enclosure. This frog, unlike my other animals, does not eat live insects. She actually eats Reptamin Plus floating food sticks. Though these are designed primarily for turtles, they also work great for aquatic amphibians. If you're curious as to why she doesn't really have any land mass, African clawed frogs are actually an entirely aquatic species. As evidenced by their alien look and huge webbed feet, these guys never leave the water. At the moment, I only have one aquarium containing fish. It's a 10 gallon setup housing three different species. An albino Senegal Bashir named Pancake, two coolie loaches, and one banjo catfish. As you can see, Pancake is the most prominent and active member of the tank. Many commenters have reminded me that she could potentially grow between eight and 12 inches long. But don't worry, I do have plenty of aquariums set aside for future use. All the fish in this aquarium, just like my turtles, feed primarily on Hikari sinking carnivore pellets. 
And as you can see, Pancake is very adept at sniffing them out. Now, as always, we come to the creepy crawly portion of the video and take a look at my invertebrates. If you can't handle bugs or spiders, go ahead and skip to the end because I do have a few important announcements to make. At the moment, I'm keeping four different species of invertebrates, each unique in their own regard, and though they're normally scattered around the room, I've gathered them on my main table for ease of filming. We'll start on the far right with one of my most recent additions, which you guys will remember if you watched the video I created making this setup. Housed in this tiny 2.5 gallon terrarium is an animal that some people may find more frightening than the cat skull sitting inside. This enclosure houses one Scolopendra heros castaniceps, or Texas giant red-headed centipede. And though it's not full grown, it's only about four inches long, it is still a sight to behold. Due to the variety of hiding places and secretive nature of this centipede, it may not grace us with its presence, but I can definitely add footage of it in post. Even though I'm caring for this animal, I still rarely get to see it. This centipede is an incredibly fast, sneaky little guy, and I only really catch a glimpse of it when I throw a cricket or a dubia roach in there every week or so. To the left of our centipede friend is another venomous invertebrate. This rather colorful enclosure houses my Chilean rosehair tarantula. As you can see, since the last video I featured her in, she's dug quite a burrow for herself under this piece of cork bark. Though she hasn't laid many webs in this enclosure, that's pretty typical for her species. It's very nice that she's created a burrow in there, however, because it means that I can drop an insect right in front and she'll come out and grab it immediately. Though tarantulas may be frightening to quite a number of people, this species in particular is actually incredibly docile. Bites from rosehair tarantulas are incredibly rare as they use their fangs as a last resort. As you can see, she is very dexterous, she's a good climber, and a really beautiful spider. You can see how they got the name Rosehair by the sort of rose gold color on her backside. This spider is very easy to care for. I just throw an insect in every week or so, keep the water dish full, and let her do her thing. Continuing to the left, we come to a species that is not venomous, but poisonous. This small green carrier houses two of a centipede's closest relatives a large pair of Sonoran Desert Millipedes. These beautiful chocolatey brown creatures are not nearly as dangerous as their centipede cousins. And though secreting a cyanide compound is their main defense mechanism, it's perfectly safe to handle them if you wash your hands right after. Unlike centipedes, these guys are decomposers, which means that they eat rotting plant matter, fruits, and vegetables. In total, both of these individuals span between six and seven inches long. So long as they're kept somewhat damp and supplied with a variety of plant matter to eat, these guys make great pets and are very easy to care for. Our fourth and final invertebrate species is an animal that grosses out many viewers, but quickly becomes a fan favorite at many tabling events that I go to. Housed in this small sterilite tub are 12 Madagascar giant hissing cockroaches, an animal that truly lives up to its name. Though many view cockroaches as vile, disgusting creatures, these are actually an incredibly unique, social, and fascinating insect. Though it may be strange to see someone handling six cockroaches in one hand, I'm not at risk of contracting any diseases because these roaches are from Madagascar. They're from the rainforest, and they're very unlike any roaches you'll find in your home. Though I'll admit, I did just pick all of those guys up for the shock factor, this species is actually really interesting to learn about and heavily researched in the scientific community. When I bring these animals to tabling events, one of the questions that I love to ask kids is, which of these do you think is the boy, and which do you think is the girl? The males actually have these two little horns on top of their heads, and they use those similarly to how a rhino uses its horns, to spar with other males or attract mates. The female, by contrast, only has two small rounded bumps on top of her head. Now that we've gotten through everyone in my room, I do have a few closing remarks. And I've brought Skink out to help me make them, so it stays interesting. Even though this is my very last reptile room tour, for the time being, it by no means marks an end to my channel. I have every intention of continuing to push out content for you guys, and already on the list is footage from a reptile expo I attended, footage from a tabling event about three days ago, 
and tens of gigabytes of footage from my trip to Costa Rica. I promise that just because I won't have animals in my home doesn't mean that I'll stop producing interesting content. I'm also going to be publishing a video soon showing you guys exactly where the animals are going to be spending their next year, setting them up in their foster homes and saying goodbye. A lot of things are going to change in the next year or two, but it's likely that by this time next year, I'm going to have a place to my own where I can keep these guys indefinitely. I have every intention of bringing my animals back from their foster homes and continuing to watch over them and care for them as they grow. Conservation, education, and the care of reptiles are the three main things that I plan to do in life, so I don't see this channel going anywhere anytime soon. With that said, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your continued interest in my channel and in the natural world around us. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to leave a like. If you have any questions, I try to respond to every comment I can. And if you haven't already, don't be afraid to hit that subscribe button to see more reptile and amphibian related content in the future. Thank you all so much for watching.